happy. Just that herb, just that kid for. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's webinar um, from Latinas in Tech. My name is Rosio Van Europe. I'm co founder and executive director uh, here at Latinas in Tech. Um, if you are not familiar with our organization, Latinas in Tech, at Latinas in Tech, it is our mission to ensure that Latinas are well represented, growing, leading, and thriving in the tech industry. We aim to hold tech companies accountable for hiring, retaining, and including Latinas in full-time, equally paid jobs. We dream of the day where racial and ethnic, the racial and ethnic footprint of tech companies mimic the one, the one of the cities we live in. Before I go ahead, I'd like to take a look at, uh, at you guys. I see that we have almost 200 attendees. Thank you. Um, before I move on with my introduction, I'd love to let you know there is a Q&A button right under, and there's also a chat. So please, um, if you don't mind, go to the chat and let me know if you can hear me well or send me your comments. Yeah, you can see me. Okay, great. I was getting very nervous. All right. As I mentioned before, we're Latinas in Tech. We're really excited. Today is a very, very important webinar in the history of our organization. But before we start, um, before I introduce this panel, I'd like for all of us to take a moment of silence uh, for the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmoud Arbery, and so many other black lives that were lost to violence, racism, and brutality. Thank you. Regrettably, it is because of the loss of these individuals that many of us are now finally recognizing racial justice and equality as part of our fight. Last week, we published a statement sharing where we stand on racial justice and how we will show up for the Black and Afro-Latinx community moving forward. As a community organization, we know we can do better in the inclusion and belonging of our Afro-Latina members, and we will. We know we need to combat anti-Blackness and colorism with conviction and intentionality, and we will. Today, I'm proud to take the first step with my team and this community, adopting a change framework by the public academic activist, Rachel Craig, Craigle, sorry. We will galvanize this community through knowledge, empathy, and action. So with this panel, our objective is simple. We will listen and learn from the perspective for, from the perspectives and life and lived experiences of Afro-Latinas in tech. Then, next week, we will host an open forum for us to reflect and internalize our learnings together. Please look out for the email invite and social media posts announcing the forum at the end of this week. Finally, this programming series will culminate in a round table for us to co-create long-standing action plans, both as individuals and employees, capable of driving change. This is only the beginning of our anti-racism work at the organizational level. Our goal is to create content and programming which is inclusive of all of our members and the interse intersectionalities that many Latinas have to, sorry, and intersectionalities that many Latinas have to please uh, have. So please keep uh, this place uh, respectful, safe, and welcoming to all. This discussion will feature two Latinas in tech who are leaders in both the Latinx and Black communities. Julissa Ramirez, Technical Program Manager at Google, and Catalina Peña, Founder and Career Coach at Catalyst Creation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Claudia Cruz, a founding member of Latinas in Tech, technology reporter and CNET alumna, uh, during the past few years, Claudia has led conversations around technology, intersectionality, and advancement of our community. Claudia, thank you so much, and please welcome, I welcome you to the stage. 
Hola, Rocío, and welcome. Hola. So I'll take over from here, right? Okay. Uh, saludos, I'm Claudia Cruz, your moderator for what promises to be a very enlightening panel on race in the Latino community, and specifically um, how that relates to the technology sector. Um, as Rocio mentioned, um, I am a veterana of Latinos in Tech. Uh, Latinas in Tech, I have moderated several panels and um, at their uh, Latina Summit. And I've also am um, a launch member of CNET en Español. Um, I have now since left that team, that wonderful team, and am now the director of the internship program at the Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, I know Julissa from uh, back in the days, and I'm very excited to, to get to know Catalina uh, throughout this conversation. Uh, just to simplify, uh, before we start, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the terminology that you might hear and just provide some definitions. Again, these are very simple dictionary um, definitions. I'm sure that uh, ethnic, uh, race, and race and gender studies uh, scholars might have additional information, but as you will hear throughout this, uh, we're here to talk about our experiences, but we definitely encourage you to uh, learn on your own uh, as well. There's a lot of resources out there. So race, race is usually considered a category of humankind. If you fill out, filled out your census, and if you haven't, you should, um, it usually includes uh, white, black, Asian, American Indian, Alaska Native, um, and uh, Asian Pacific Islander, and Native, and Native Hawaiians. Uh, nationality, you'll hear thrown around as well, and that's usually nationhood, the country of origin where uh, your parents are from or, were from or where you were born. And ethnicity is usually the, the commonality of those of people who are categorized in these different areas. So for example, Latino is an ethnicity. Um, I'm Dominican by, by my parents' nationality. Uh, um, you, uh, from the United States is my uh, um, nationality and my, my race is black. Um, the other terms I want to define quickly is racism, uh, prejudice, discrimination, and colorism. Uh, racism is a belief that race is a primary, primary determinant of uh, a trait or capacity. And racism is, this, is also the system that keeps those, um, that hierarchy in place. Prejudice is considered more of the attitude, um, the, the attitude of hostility directed against individuals or groups based on, again, judgments, and it could, in this case, race. Uh, discrimination is actually the action, the action taken, um, supported by the system. Um, and colorism is prejudice and discrimination within a racial and ethnic group, and I'm sure this will come up again, and not just because, um, you know, Anyway, if let's say in one country you may have different races, but even within one country like Dominican Republic, where most of us or all of us are black, there is still colorism. So there is a hierarchy based on, uh, or there's a perceived hierarchy uh, based on the color of your skin. So with that, um, I will tell you that throughout these uh, couple weeks, uh, days, I mean, I've lived with, with uh, identity of race for a long time, but definitely I myself have had to uh, question a lot of the things that I've um, do that I say, and uh, um, I'm working on myself. This is a, a forever process, and I'm hoping that this conversation allows you to also um, begin to question and check yourself so that you can roll and we can get to where we want to be, which is uh, a better society. So with that, I want to bring in Catalina and Julissa. I think they are now unmuted and their videos are on. And thank you everyone who joined us uh, this Thursday. So Julissa, I'm going to kick it off with you. Um, and again, a lot of this is about your lived experience. So when did you first identify as a Black Latina? When did you realize that race was part of your identity? Before I answer that, I want to add to your commentary. And I want to say that race expands skin tone. It also has to do with physical features, different things for, for me as an Afro-Latina. The thing that makes me Afro-Latina is not just the fact that I have African blood and that my culture accentuates a lot of African background, but it has to do with my features and the way that I show up in the world. Um, and then your question was, when was the first time? So I have two very vivid memories from my childhood. The first one, so I was born in Dominican Republic and I came to the United States when I was nine and I was raised in the Bronx, New York by Fordham, if anybody knows what that's at. 
Um, and for me, when I arrived at JFK as a little nine-year-old girl with my little sister in hand, because we traveled by ourselves, our mother was here, she had immigrated before us. And I looked up and around and all of these people, Caucasian and of all kinds of different backgrounds, um, I was shocked because that's not, coming from Dominican Republic from a small island, I just wasn't used to seeing so many Caucasian people. So that was the first time that I felt different. And I would say that the second time uh, I identified um, that I need to learn more about race is in high school. I think I was filling out a form for a program and they asked, like you said, are you white, black, Asian, Pacific Islander or other? And I'm over here and we're like, um, well, I'm not white, that's for sure. Um, I don't know if I'm black, I think I'm brown and that's not an option. And I'm like, I'm sure I'm, I'm not Asian. But then when I saw Pacific Islander, I'm like, well, Dominican Republic is an island. <laughs> <laughs> so am I like a Pacific Islander? I don't know. So I remember either putting, you know, A, B, and D, and other. I don't remember which one I checked, but I genuinely didn't know. And that's because growing up in Dominican Republic, we didn't have those conversations of who's a Black Latina? Like, what do you identify with? Um, are you a mestiza, et cetera? Um, yeah, I think that those are my two experiences. Catalina, did you want to answer this as well? Yeah, definitely. And thank you, Claudia, uh, Claudia and Julissa for, you know, uh, sharing your experiences. I think it's so varied um, kind of with this particular question and also the sentiments around, let's not forget where this conversation is coming from, right? Lives are lost because of people's um, skin color of people's features of people's beliefs of somebody who look different than them and so you know I think even on the panel I just want to acknowledge like you're like we're all on the panel very privileged right we all have uh, mixed features meaning that we don't we could pass as something else and that's something that I really carry with me um, and so that's how I'm going to start my story around like how I noticed race right I'm actually biracial, and so I'm a biracial black woman, um, Afro-Latina. So what that means is that my, my mom is white and my dad is black, and so I have a white side of a family and a black side of a family. And the funny thing is the black side does not identify as black because they're like a little bit lighter skin and they're like, well, we are not. And then, you know, my white uh, family like always called my dad El Negro. And so like it was always, I always grew up with those words, but I never knew what they actually meant. And so I also moved here to the States when I was nine, I came to Houston, but I ended up growing up with just my mom who's white. And so I knew I was dark. I knew I was dark and I'm, I'm saying like, I'm not cause I'm light, right? But I'm not white. And so every time like I would go in the sun cause Houston's hot and I would get like, like really dark. My mom would be like, stay out of the sun. Or when my curls started coming out, my mom was like, what happened to your hair? Like things like that, that were really hurtful. Um, and I don't think she meant it in a really bad way, but it, to me internalized that I was other, like I was not, you know, the typical Colombian woman um, and looked like the typical Colombian woman, especially from where I came from in Bogota. And so that like followed me into high school. And then I went to college in a primarily white institution, PWI. Uh, Nebraska, <laughs> for those of you who, who don't know. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Julissa, for that face. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. It's like, what? Yeah, and then it was um, mostly Mexican, um, Latins, right, that, that were there. And I didn't have a lot of Caribbean influence. So I always felt other even there. So I was like, that is not my story. That is not my lived experience. And then I was hanging out with like the Black, um, you know, association and going in between worlds. And that's been my whole life. And I didn't really have a term for what that was until... Uh, you know, a few years ago after Latina, I was like, okay, let me, I think that make, that like combines everything that I feel and who I feel because when I said I was black, a lot of uh, people in the black community actually challenged me and are like, well, you're light, you know, you don't look black, you're Colombian, you're this, you're that. And so I even, you know, was afraid to admit my blackness because I was like, well, maybe I'm doing a disservice to those who are darker than me who do face a bigger struggle than I do. So I have no, I have no right here. And so, you know, that's why um, I kind of want to honor that experience as well, uh, because, you know, being darker skinned um, and having more Afrocentric features does mean that you get treated differently sometimes in some in certain rooms. Um, and even I, with like the features that I have, I get treated that way as well. So, you know, it's a very multi-layered conversation. I'm really excited 
to have the space to discuss it, but this is not something that, this is something I've been studying and I'm still studying, <laughs> like living, studying, breathing, like questioning, you know, I'm 29. So um, for 29 years, and I still don't have every single answer. Um, and so, you know, I'm really excited we're having this discussion. I will share my experience. I think I was maybe six, I'm from New York City, I'm from Washington Heights, uh, which has been in the news recently. Um, and uh, my family's also from the Dominican Republic, but I was born in New York. And like Lisa said, New York is so multicultural, but in New York, I'm um, in my neighborhood, which is primarily Dominican, I was a majority. Um, so then I would go to Miami, I had an aunt, I have an aunt who lives in Miami, and for summer breaks, you no, know, Latina working mom couldn't take care of me during the summer, so shipped me off to my tia in Miami. And in Miami, no, you have a bunch of other Latinos because it's closer to America, obviously. And I was hanging out, uh, playing with this little boy, and he called my skin dirty. I was like six or seven. And I'm just like, I showered this morning. There's no way I'm dirty. And then he's like, no, your skin is dirty. And I'm like, no, I showered. This is my, you know, I'm, I had a complejo about being clean. So I go to my aunt and it, she made it clear. And I remember the conversation with the kid's parents because they, you know, they reprimanded him immediately that no, there's some Latinos who are just different colors than you. And the little boy, the family was Guatemalan. Um, the second and third times and fourth time was in high school. I went to boarding school. So at 14, I left New York and went to New Hampshire. And that's when you realize that you are a minority in a, within like, you know, I think that we like, I was part of the 1% of Latinos in all of New Hampshire and I was in high school. And you know, you get called the N word crossing the street, right? Um, I lived in Spain in high school and Spain isn't, wasn't as diverse as it is now in 1994 when I lived there. <laughs> and there was, I was called, uh, you know, there was a lot of, human trafficking. They thought I was a prostitute. I was a student there. And the prostitutes were coming from Latin America, unfortunately. Um, you know, the trafficking was occurring from Latin America, and a lot of them were uh, Black women. So I, I just had this awakening that I was perceived by the world very differently. Uh, but I, I began to embrace it. Um, I had friends in, in high school who were, I always joined the African-American groups and they said, you're black, you're black, you're black. So I'm like, okay, I'm black, I'm black, I'm black. So it's been part of my identity for, for many years. And, and just for, I, I want to assume that people understand um, the, colon, the history of colonization in Latin America, but I, I will just quickly give a very brief history. Uh, we know uh, what happened in 1492 uh, when Columbus arrived, he first arrived in Hispaniola, which is the island now shared by Haiti and Dominican Republic, and the first slaves were brought to the Dominican Republic. There's no, there, there's no ifs and buts about that. They were brought to the Dominican Republic. And from there, they, re, they, they kept conquering uh, the rest of Latin America, and it spread, and it's mostly in the Caribbean basin, which would include Venezuela and Colombia and Panama, um, Honduras would include the other, the, obviously Mexico has a, a African, uh, Afro Mexico, Me Mexican population. We're everywhere in Latin America. Um, Black Latinos, everyone in Latin America. It's just the, the, the attitude um, has been of that of suppressing the blackness. So to continue, and I think uh, Catalina, you, you quickly touched on that when race became a part of your identity. And you mentioned um, in, in, in college joining the African-American Association. How, how did that kind of help you, help, help you build um, an awareness of self? Yeah, so, you know, I think when I was in college and I, I so let me preface this, like I came to Houston and Houston's very diverse, but it's very segregated. And so if you were Latino, you hang out with your Latinos. If you were Black, you hang out with, you know, Black people. If you're Asian with Asian, white people with Black people. And I was always in like the AP classes. So I was just hanging out with a lot of white people. Cause I was like, these, these are the people who are in my classes. So I never really, I thought about it, but it wasn't a central, um, a central thing to my, to my identity quite yet. Cause I wasn't, I was, I was not focused on that. And I had the privilege to not be focused on that. And um, when I was in college and I started going to, you know, the black student unions, um, like meetings and things like that, you know, I started to see how beautiful blackness is. And like, it's so sad that my whole, my own family, like both sides don't see, don't see that. I actually had an aunt, um, maybe like a year ago when I went there and she's darker than me. She's a lot darker than me. And I was like, no, pero yo soy afro latina, yo soy negra. Um, and she was like, no, tú no eres negra. And I'm like, 
<laughs> like, why is that a bad thing? Why is me claiming my blackness? Why is me actually claiming my ancestors a bad thing? And so in college, when I saw um, for the first time, like, I think black people just celebrating the fact that they're black, I was like, what is this? Like, being black is supposed to be bad. Being black is not supposed to be a good thing. And like, it generated a lot of conflict in me because I was just like, well, you know, my family is like saying this, but this is a beautiful culture. This is a beautiful space. Everybody's celebrating the fact that, you know, their skin color and their features and their culture and everything. Like, what is, you know, what is this? And, you know, it really opened my eyes to really start accepting my blackness and who I was and really step into that and be like, no, you know, my black is beautiful and our black is beautiful in the Latinx community. Like we need to embrace that. We need to believe that because um, our ancestors, like you mentioned, I think we had more ancestors, more slaves come to, um, uh, to Latin America than to actual America, right? We had more slaves and, um, you know, those are our ancestors and there will we get our power and so the fact that that has been erased and so negated and is just really appalling to me. And I really want us to be better. Did you want to um, chime in, Julissa? We can keep it going. We can keep it going. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of, like, if you can talk about your background as you answer this question, um, how has race been a, a challenge uh, at work? Uh, we obviously know black is beautiful. I was going to say that like lo negro es bello was one of my hashtags for today. Uh, but we also know that there, it comes with obstacles and it comes with challenges that some of your non-black peers uh, don't worry about, um, including your Latinos, non-black peers. What kind of challenges have you noticed? Because I know you were at Intel before uh, Google. I know Intel made significant strides in, in trying to diversify its, um, its employee base. And, and actually increase pay for a, a lot of workers too. But what have you noticed has worked, hasn't worked in Silicon Valley? You've been there now long enough. You know, what, it, what I feel is, so you take Latinos in technology, there's a small portion, and then you take Latinas in technology, this is an even smaller portion. And then you go and you say, okay, so you take Afro-Latinas, and then you say, that's a very, very small portion. And then you say, how many of them are technical? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very, very, very small portion. Um, I also, like Atalina, I want to acknowledge my privilege in that I am Afro-Latina, I am lighter skin, and the reality is that the isolation, and I would say, is much more worse for more melanated. The more melanated you are, I feel like the worse it gets. Um, but... I think the challenge for me came from being the only person of color in many of my teams is about, again, that isolation and that pain you feel when something happens to the Latino or the black community and you're expected to continue to work as usual. I think for me, it's about microaggressions. Like I remember um, being at Intel and I came uh, with my hair, I did a wash and go with my curly hair and if you know me, a lot of times you'll see me that I, I blow dry my hair a lot just because it's easier. I don't have time for curly hair. <laughs> curly hair is a lot. But the day that I do bring my curly hair because I don't have time to blow dry it, that my Asian coworker runs to me and is like, oh my God, and grabs my hair. And I just, I, I didn't know how to even react to that. And I'm just like, don't do that. Like, that's not okay. And I remember going to my, to the bathroom and like crying about it because I grew up with, you know, my, in my family, they would be like, tu tienes pelo malo, like you have bad hair. Um, and I grew up with that insecurity. My hair has been a huge insecurity for me. And even now, like I'm embracing it more, like I have more curls and I'm trying to learn how to finger twist and do all these things. But that hasn't been my experience. I actually learned how to straighten my hair from my aunt in the salon. Um, she taught me how to do that. So for me, um, it's the little microaggressions that happen. Um, I also get the comment that I'm very lively or sassy. And there's that negative undertone to that. There's like a, like you have an edge, you're different, you're not like me. Um, and I think too, my, I think somebody mentioned in, um, in one of the comments like, oh, you know, um, they look ambiguous. And that ambiguity sometimes when you look at me, you don't know, like, is she mixed? Is she black? Is she, what is she? 
that inability to put me into a box creates a lot of discomfort sometimes. So like going to Mi Pueblo or like one of the Cardenas supermarkets and the guy's talking about me in Spanish and I'm like, hello, yo entiendo, like I understand. Um, those are like the little, and that happens at work too, so. La puya, puya. <laughs> La puya, yeah. Catalina, uh, you are uh, a coach. You are, can you talk a little bit about what you do and in relationship, I think, to, uh, to this conversation? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I also was in tech before, so I'll kind of go into my tech experience and like why I built the company the way that I have built my company um, now that I have the space to. So I was at a bunch of different companies in Silicon Valley, and I was also at a really big company um, selling pharmaceutical products. And, um, you know, in those companies, kind of, I experienced both physical uh, <laughs> microaggressions and racism, and also very mental and um, microaggressions and racism. And I'm getting actually nervous talking about this because I never thought I would be talking about this in front of anyone publicly, honestly. And I'm not five people here. There's yeah. no, no, no I'm not, not going to name any names or anything, but still it's, it's really uncomfortable to reflect. Um, cause there's some stuff that I haven't dealt with like mentally still, um, just because it's, it's so fresh. I feel like it happened in the last five, six years. So the first time <laughs> that I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely like black here. And this is, this is me like showing up like black at work was when I actually had a coworker, eight coworkers in a meeting. And my hair used to be straight, like Julissa was saying, I used to straighten it. And that day I didn't straighten it and do anything. To be honest, I was having a bad hair day. I was, I wasn't happy. It was not the best hair day, but it was like, it was not bad. And basically they all went around the room and, or they were like, this is a talk about professionalism. There was no managers in the room. There's a talk about professionalism. And every single person was like, is it this, is it this, is it this? And then they got to me and I was like, I'm professional. Like, what are you talking about? I'm dressed professional, my hair is good. And they were like, your hair, it doesn't look like it did the first day. And we're going to a conference and we don't want you to, to wear it that way because it's going to basically embarrass us and not make us look professional as a team. And that day I cried so much. And there was no one in that room that's, that stood up for me. There was no one in the room that stood up for me. And it was my hair, like, which is ridiculous. And I didn't know that HR was a thing, that I could go to HR and like, sue people. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, and then the thing is, be, uh, the difference between being Latina and being like an Afro-Latina or a Black Latina is how people label you, right? So... I'm outspoken, I'm loud, <laughs> like I challenge people, right? If you're a white passing Latina, that means you're spicy. You have, you, like, you know, you're passionate, you're this. When you're a black Latina, that means you're aggressive or defensive or can't take feedback or, or doing that. And in one of those cases, in, mo in a lot of these cases, can cost you a job just because people perceive you as a threat. People perceive you as threatening versus just being passionate and I think that is a really fine line of when you know if you're black or not because I know a lot of people are like oh well, I, I am Afro Latina am I not are you perceived as threatening are you perceived as aggressive are you perceived negatively in any context when someone feels um feels like they're cornered and if that's true you're probably you know like go explore your identity and your blackness a little bit more if you're not then you know that's something for you to explore as well but, you know, that's really when I realized I was like, oh, I'm not having a normal experience, a normal Latina experience. Like, this is not, you know, this is not, and this is, this is because of my skin color, because of my features, because of how people perceive me. And that was really difficult. That was a very difficult time. So now, when I created my company, I help support diverse professionals, black and brown. And I tell them, <laughs> like, I tell my, the people that I support and the communities I support is know what you're signing up for know what you're signing up for when you go to certain companies or certain spaces. And if you're Afro-Latina or Black or Latina, you're an, a minority, understand what that means and understand what that will do to your mental health. Understand how to show up and how to, uh, how to advance in that world. And that's what I help people do if they choose to do that. If they don't, I'm like, I'm here to support whatever else you want to do. Because I think that we should all show up as our full selves and be fully supported. And that's not always the case. And in some organizations so you just have to figure out which one is for you and I helped doing that I helped do that so it's unfortunate because I feel like my hair has nothing to do with my job like 
Mm -hmm. I also, I want to share another experience that was really um, crazy and that happened within my own family. So I married a white passing Puerto Rican. Well, he's half to make a Puerto Rican. And my sister married uh, an Asian, half Asian, half white male. And we were all hanging out, having a barbecue at my mom's house in New Jersey. And my grandma's out and she looks at my two darker cousins. Um, Claudia, they're probably like three shades darker than you are. And she says, um, Kimberly Dariana, I just want you to know, you have to learn from Julissa Natacha. You have to marry lighter because we, we need to better the race. And I know a lot of Afro-Latinos have heard this. And to know that it came from my own sweet little grandmother, <laughs> she is a beautiful heart. And I was just, my mouth dropped. But I think it is important for us to speak of and, you know, correct our families. And I think that's part of the work and colorism and addressing it. It starts at home. For me, I, was, I just sat with my grandma and I was like, grandma, please, you never say that. And this is why. Um, and I hope that we all take some of this back with our darker skin tone family members and defend them and stand up for them when things like this are said and happen. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had to take it away from work and, yeah. and No, that's and good, because it actually leads to the next question. Mm -hmm. I love these segues. Uh, so what do you think keeps Latinos from questioning how we talk about race in the community? Obviously, it's, it's this, uh, is it telenovelas? Is it Univision Telemundo, which has been in the news for its coverage of the riots recently? What is it? I mean, I mentioned two big ones <laughs> there, but... It, but what, what keeps us from talking about race within the Latino community and seeing progress in Latin America and in the U.S.? Yeah. I, me? Oh, okay. Catalina. <laughs> like, Let's go with Catalina. You can go. It, it, it's okay. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Um, no, so I think uh, kind of like to go off what Julissa was saying with family members, I think I would take that even a step further and start with yourself. Because the thing is, like, there's so much internalized uh, racism and colorism and prejudices that you don't even know. And like a really simple exercise that you can do, and I, I like I do this as part of some of my trainings, is literally take a piece of paper, like right now, if you can, write down the word white and write down the word black, okay? And if you're bilingual, blanco y negro. And then write all of the words that come to mind when you're listing those out. And there, and there you'll see how ingrained white is with good and black is with bad within you, right? Um, because it comes out with everything. If you, like, I think in technical terms, there's like a whitelist versus blacklist or something like that, right? Whitelist meaning it's good, blacklist meaning is bad. And, or like not, not suitable for code or something like that, right? And so even in that, even in technology, it, it creeps up. It, and so even starting with like the language you're using, the beliefs that you're having, I think that's what's the hardest part because it's meaning it's facing the things about you that are not very pretty. Right. Everybody has a degree of pre prejudice. Everybody has a degree of racism that they've lived with or that they thought or that they've, everybody has that. And to actually face that, mm. <laughs> like that's hard. That's some hard work, but that's where the change starts because then if you recognize it within yourself, then you're going to be able to recognize it with, within others and call that out and then continue to change the narrative until we all are perceived as equals. Did you want to add to that, Julissa? <laughs> Well, I think that conversation came up in the Latinas in Tech forum and our Facebook group about how can we change the word blacklist to block list, right? And I forgot what the, what the suggestion was for whitelist, but terminology is, is very important. Uh, Julissa, did you want to add to how uh, we can openly discuss race in the Latino community and in, and in the environments that we're in? I think it's hard, you know, I, I, even coming from DR, Claudia, you know, um, these conversations, there's... There's so much self-hate in our countries that even like my mother, who's again, darker than I am, when I identify as Afro-Latina, she's like, excuse me, like, what is this? <laughs> where, where did you get this from? And I explained it to her. And she's like, no, we're not, you are only Latina, you're Dominican. And I had to explain to her. So I think to Catalina's part, I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen. Um, and I think it's going to take all of us to go back and again, speak to our grandmothers, speak to our mothers and our, our family members and, and take the time to do the work. Um, but I, I think 
<laughs> I will say that I'm in part of a bunch of Dominican groups on Facebook and no one's having this conversation in those groups. Yeah. Same. It's very unfortunate. Um, so, you know, when you go back to your companies, uh, so the ERGs, employee resource groups, have been set up. Some companies set them up in the last five years, which is, again, very astounding. But in the employee resource groups, they're, supposed, they're meant to support employees of different um, intersectionalities. So LGBT, Latinos, uh, uh, Black Googlers, you know. There's all these different types of groups. Do you feel that you are represented? Do you feel, how do you feel they um, address Afro-Latinidad? Um, or do they, do they not? And what more could they, could ERGs do to, to support um, Afro-Latinas in, in the other companies? Um, do you want to start, Julissa? Since yeah, I can start. Um, so at Intel, I used to be part of the ILN network and I was the president of the local chapter. So. That was, um, I try to incorporate some events about Afro-Latino culture there. But when I came to Google, um, by the way, today is my second year anniversary at Google. Yay. Um, but the first year that I was there, a lot of the events that were in the Bay Area did not focus on any event, anything about Afro-Latino. And then they also, we also had a Latinas ad event where they invited all of the Latinas at Google and we had a beautiful two day conference again, missed the mark on the on addressing Afro-Latinidad. So that's when I decided that because I didn't see myself represented, I joined um, the board for OLA, which is our Latinx ERG. And now I'm, as of March, I'm one of the board of directors for, for that. Um, and we, because of Mr. Floyd's death um, and because of all everything that's going on, um, we've been called into action and I think there's a certain urgency that's happening now to support the black community and sure that we do some of the research so that we don't burden them with hey what do we do now what do we do now um, and we are launching a series of events that are gonna um, that are going to speak about colorism and Afro-Latinos and also we're changing the way that our calendars show up instead of maybe celebrating Cinco de Mayo maybe we can do you know a, a event for Brazilians or an event for Cubanos or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just have our, our calendars be more international and addressing all of our different countries. Um, but I will be honest and say that I am of the opinion that this work should not fall only on the ERGs, that this work needs to fall on employee engagement and diversity and inclusion. I feel like a lot of times, even for the Black Googlers Network, um, BGN, which is a Black ERG at Google, um, there's an expectation that comes from the community. How can you have an expectation for them to put on programming for their members when they themselves, the people that are doing the work, are working full-time jobs, and on top of that, then they have to think, suffer through everything that's going on and put on the programming. So I do think that we need more more help from diversity and inclusion for these kinds of events. Did you want to add anything about the ERGs? I think someone wanted to know, I saw a quick question. ERG means employee resource group. Uh, and those are again groups within companies to help um, different uh, groups on campus. <laughs> campuses. Uh, it could be like the like Asian the group, the black group, the whatever Indian group. Mm -hmm. One thing I was thinking about whenever I go to these companies is that they don't, I know that they have food that caters to probably the majority of their employees um, that they feel that people are going to eat, but they could have more international food. I want some mm -hmm. platanos at Google, right? You want yeah. some. Sometimes some, they do though. They do. Oh, good. Okay, good. <laughs> and they have sancocho sometimes. So. Oh, really? Okay. But not, it's not part, it's not every restaurant and it's not part of every campus, you know. Look at, um, I guess I, I can move on. Um, so what else, um, when it comes to, you, you mentioned that it shouldn't all fall on, on the black Googlers um, or even on you, that the, like you, know, you shouldn't have to join, be on the board, even though it's great because now you can uh, steer the group in, in, in a certain way. But let's talk about allyship. Um, and Catalina, mm -hmm. if you can talk about how we can build or how what can allies do to support um mm -hmm. afro-latinidad in, in silicon valley in, at the tech companies and and beyond and beyond that mm -hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. And I just want to acknowledge Julissa for putting in the work because, girl, I know that's not easy. Uh, you have a full-time job and you're taking essentially on a second job to help support people who are marginalized in tech. So I, big props to you. Um, I think when it comes to allyship is really making sure that you're making space. I've had organizations, Latin organizations that have, and I've voiced, I'm like, what about Afro-Latinos? And they've been like, why are you being divisive? <laughs> and I'm like, what? How am I being divisive? <laughs> Excuse, excuse me, like, <laughs> and, but that's the thing. It's seen as, you know, you're trying to break out of the Latina mold and create further division where it's like, no, my experience as a Latina is very different than yours. And so if you only have programming, and this goes for like all of the beautiful diversity that exists within the Latin community, like Asian Latinos, um, uh, indigenous Latinos, like there's so much diversity. And time and time again, I see that um, allies tend to maybe like show up or well before, like before this, they weren't really showing up, like don't like, you know, don't be divisive. And now they're showing up and it's beautiful to have the platforms to speak. It's beautiful to have all of um, these conversations happening in the education. However, I think the true action lies in, or the true difference lies in action. And what are you doing to support not only now, but year round? And also like, how are you actually supporting the movements that are tied to why, to the reason why we're having this conversation, right? So don like doing donation, uh, like fundraisers, um, you know, really donating and building bridges uh, with the black community. Because the thing is like, there's a separation for whatever reason. And, and I get it from both sides, actually. Um, and I'm, I'm able to navigate through that, but it's, it's really being intentional about building bridges and, and making people feel welcome. Because that's, that's, I think, the number one thing that I sometimes feel about uh, certain groups, Latin groups that I don't even feel welcome. And so I'm just like, okay, well, this is fun, but I'm gonna leave. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. and you definitely wanna be able to feel welcomed in, these, in all these different spaces because why not? You are who you are and it, it, it shouldn't be, it, it, there shouldn't be this exclusivity. I'm, I'm curious, I, and I'm not sure actually from the moderate, from Latinas in Tech, I think we're going just to six. So I believe there's some questions in the chat, but I, I did want to ask you um, if you have you know, a book or content or a musician, someone who's inspired you that you're like, re like read, watch, listen, to these people because they'll change your life. Um, if you have time on Netflix, watch the show. Like, what what do you recommend? Just as I mean, education, people can find education, but just supporting content that is not just um, you know white Latinos. And just to be quite frank, there's you know you can go on Netflix, but half the shows that are super popular are white Latino shows, and I'm like, where are the black Latinos on Netflix? <laughs> Uh, so or on someplace else. So what, what do you watch? Well, how do you com continue to nourish your, your blackness um, and, and pay honor to your, to your ancestors? Uh, Julissa, did you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, you know, for me, I saw the movie, the documentary 13th on Netflix. <sighs> Crazy. So I think that I also want people to know that even us, like Afro Latinas, we're, we still have to commit to do more work, to learn more, to educate. Um, and then I would say for our allies um, and for white Latinas, you know, support brown and black businesses, vote, mm -hmm. speak up when you see injustices, amplify black and brown voices, you know, donate. Another thing is, let's capitalize on our buying power and spend our dollars where it counts. Um, there's just so much that you can do. There's so many resources that are being shared right now on, on Instagram. And maybe I'll take the time. I have some um, written down and I'll send them. Maybe we can send it out as, a, as an email, but um, there's so much that we can do right now. This is the perfect time for you to educate yourself and ask the hard questions. And if anyone has a really hard question that I don't feel comfortable asking someone, I volunteer or I can direct it to someone that can answer it for you. Yeah. Katarina, anything you want to suggest? Any contents that people should 
should watch, yeah, listen. Definitely. Um, I think in terms of books, um, the book White Fragility, um, I know it sounds controversial, <laughs> but it really explains explains like how whiteness is uh, driving this anti-blackness movement because it's not easy to turn back on yourself and be like, oh wow, I have a lot of privilege and this has affected a lot of people negatively. That's actually a really hard, like just mentally to do that, uh, psychologically to do that because you're, you, you have to make space for it, right? So um, like starting with a book that kind of pushed, puts that into perspective and causes you to reflect on, on yourself and how your whiteness or your white passing um, you know, heritage has, has um, kind of shaped your experience is really good. Um, I think in terms of uh, documentary, somebody was saying, I think Sandra Cruz um, put Henry Louis Gates, Blacks in Latin America. Um, that was really eye-opening because I was actually doing some research um, for another panel I had on Afro Latina. And um, it just kind of highlights the differences between all of the countries and like Blackness is not the same everywhere. So like, I think in Brazil, he said something, there's something like, a hundred and like 16 ways to be black. Like you're not just black. <laughs> like Caramelo, like every one of us it would be a different shade and there's it's levels. a different word and there's levels. And it's like, and, and um, actually like, uh, it ex like it explains a little bit of the history behind how blackness came to be or like how blackness came to be erased um, in Latin America because at Brazil like got the most population of like slaves and then they had to, you know, bring in people from Portugal to like whitewash um, the country, which is so interesting um, that they had to do that. And, you know, um, just in terms of like fun things, <laughs> like very problematic, very problematic, I will say for a lot of reasons, but uh, it does have an Afro-Colombian star, which I, which I think is awesome. Um, oh, what is it called? I think Siempre it's... Labu Siempre and um, it really like, shows um it's like a, about this uh slave that comes into the future and she just you know she's a she's a black woman a black latina and like her um kind of discovering the world and not going back into slavery and she leads revolts and it's actually very very um very very interesting um and reading about the first uh free settlement actually in colombia i, I believe that was the first free slave settlement every like in latin america it's palenque and knowing that there are people out there that are very, very proud to be um, Afro-Latinos, they're very, very proud to be Black, and like learning from them and how do we incorporate that um, into, into this. And then just to echo Julissa's um, uh, statement, buy from Black and Brown businesses, support Black and Brown founders, because that's the thing. They're the ones that are really going to create spaces for you and really be able to use their economic power to create change. But if you are always going to brands that are like just uh, putting out like Black Lives Matter uh, company posts, <laughs> like shout out to Laura Silva. She's another Afro-Colombian. She's amazing. She like did this post on LinkedIn about like, I show me your receipts, you know, show me the pictures of your board. I don't, I'm not interested in your, in your statements. I'm interested in your board. So, um, you know, and change. Um, in terms of this group, Latinas in Tech, and again, thank you so much for uh, jumpstarting this conversation within this group. I, I don't have the statistic, it was I think mailed to me, but I think Afro-Latinas are only 2.6% of all the Latinas within tech. Latinas it's such a tech. small number, it's really, really small. Um, what more could Latinas in tech do to amplify supporting Afro-Latinidad? I think follow up to this event, right? I, I feel like it doesn't end here. This, is, this has to be the beginning of the conversation. Um, I'd love to see more representation on the board level. I'd love to see more um, opportunities for melanated voices to be heard. Whenever you have a panel, make sure that you're including somebody that's Afro-Latino, maybe uh, somebody from the LGBTQ community that's happens. You know, all of these things we have to keep in mind and continue adding. And I think they're on the right path. Yeah. And I, and I think also just like making sure that um, that you guys continue these conversations in your circles like Julissa was saying like um go after this panel call your grandma and be like this is what i learned call your auntie and call your tia your tio and like have these hard conversations like because if the conversation is here we didn't really accomplish anything 
I'm just quickly, sorry, reading through some of the questions. Julissa, you have a fan from Miami. <laughs> you have other fans here. Um, well, my friends think, showing up for me. <laughs> you guys touched upon this, um, but it's asked, that I think, once again, if you can just, you know, talking to your abuelita is very difficult. I remember Natia, me, I was watching, I was in VR, and they were showing the new police recruits for like the new cadets, right? And my, my, my tia abuela dice, ay, pero están dejando mucho haitiano entrar al país, because look, half the police force is black. And I'm just like, pero abuela, pero tía. I'm like, we're black too. Like, I'm pretty sure, first of all, Haitians, we're Haitians. Like, th the country has been so mixed over the years. But secondly, Dominicans are black. So how can you tell? You can't tell. So I was just so upset. But I, I don't, I think I just told her that. I'm like, but we're black too. Like, I don't understand why, why you're picking on Haitians when we're black. Um, and you know what? If, they, if they're joining the police force because they want to be part of the police department and they, why not? What's wrong with that? So how do you really have these conversations? It's just because you don't want to, you know, are you really changing their minds or is this more because, so they don't say, so they don't repeat it again to other people? Because you may not, I mean, it's a very, it's very delicate with, uh, it can be very delicate, especially with that older generation. Con los, con los primos, you know, you have it all the time because, but yeah. I think it's hard. I, you know, with my mom, I can just continue having these conversations whenever I hear her say like, you know, racist things. Cause my mom does say that sometimes. Um, I think with my grandma, I don't think there's changing her mentality, but I always come from a place of love because one thing that I've learned is that it's not, I feel like they were raised this way. They have like a core belief in certain things and they're, they've been raised with certain, certain, saying certain things. Um, I don't know that after like 60 years, my mom is going to start saying something different. But at least I know that I did my part educating her. And I am showing up with love to try to help her understand, not from anger. I don't know if that helps a lot at all. I but. Hope it helps somebody. <laughs> uh, another question from Desiree, do you feel like the way our communities understand racism is about an individual behavior or flaw or is it systemic? You know, we talk about systemic racism in this country because we know that laws have been uh, put in place in a certain way. In, in Latin America, is it systemic as, way, as well? Is it cultural? Is it community? Is it class? You know, a lot of it has to do with class as well in Latin America. How do you, Catalina, from your research, um, how, do you, how do you see it? How do you view it in Latin America, maybe uh, compared to the US? System, is this individual decisions? Is it systemic decisions, um, issues? So I, I think that's a really, amazing question, and thank you for bringing that up. And I have two minutes, so I'll try to make this quick. <laughs> but, um, you know, I definitely think it's systemic, but it's not systemic like the way that it's been in the US. This is something I've thought about a lot because I did grow up in, in Colombia and I grew up there, and I go back a lot, and then I grew up here. Here, it's very clear, it doesn't matter what your class is, if you're black, you're black, right? Um, and ha people have been gunned down, unfortunately, doctors, all the way doctors to, to people who are homeless, like that, it runs the gamut, right? But in Latin America, it's a little bit different. I think it may be a little bit more insidious because uh, black people are accepted as Colombians, as Dominicans, we're all part of one country, right? So there's no, there's no racism, there's no colorism, we're all, we're all one. Like you're not a uh, black Colombian, you know, you're like African American, no, you're, you're Colombian, you're good. And, um, and then we pointed to the socioeconomic, right, uh, status. And it's like, okay, well, you know, they're, they're like lazy or they're not smart or they're not this because they're at the bottom of the socioeconomic um, like totem pole. And it's like, okay, but like only 4% of Afro-Latinos in Colombia go to college. Like, tell me how is that possible? And how, how is it that like when they actually get to the top, like, yes, they're accepted, but they're still, you know, talked about like, oh, el negro and la negra and da, 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 right? So it's like, it's very systemic, but in a very different way. Um, than in America, and it's and it's harder to get out as a Black Latino in Latin America than it is here to get out as a um, as a Black American out of like poverty and all of that stuff. I would say because um, you know, and I don't have any statistics or anything, but I would say that um, just because they're the gatekeepers are really strong. Like if you don't come from money, like you're never gonna come from money. 
Well, in terms of systemic, I found um, it's, it was shared. You know, there's a lot of sharing happening now, which is great because that means it's knowledge. People want to learn. And in Mexico, Ox, um, in 2019, Oxfam, uh, it's, I think an NGO um, put out a, a, a survey. Or talk, they, they analyzed the Afro, Afro-Mexicanidad. And one thing that I learned recently was that the first census to include uh, black Mexicans was in 2015. And black Mexicans have, I'm sure, have been there since 1550, <laughs> right? So, a black, um, a black Mexican president, I think, very, very early on, which is so interesting. Yeah. And so in 2015, 2.6% identified as, as Afro Mexicano, which means that it's probably more, but it could be because of, of this. Um, um, supremacy of wanting to be white, just like we do here. You don't know what box to check. People have checked um, white Mexican or indigenous or mestizo, right? Instead of mulatto. Um, of that 2.6% identified as black, uh, only 6.2% had higher education, which I presume, because it wasn't clear, meant university. So only 6.2% of an already very small percentage is going to um, college. And of that percentage, it's even less because most it's 71 percent are not women so it's which women are self-selecting out or are not being able to to attain a higher education so what, so i'm going to bring this back to a question that, that came up um in the q a um it's going back to latinas in tech um what the question precisely from milagros is how do we truly establish a network of latinas in tech that support each other given our history of colonialism multiracial and different backgrounds. I mean, what is it beyond um, having, um, uh, you know, Julissa, you participating in every panel from now on, or Catalina, which is oh, only two. <laughs> <laughs> I decline. No, it's like, um, <laughs> I think, it, I think, I think we need to bring more indigenous voices. To, like there's just so, so many intricacies like Garifunas. Like I love, I would love to learn about, um, there was there's a very small population of Afro Argentinos that live in Argentina. Imagine the racism, right? Because a lot of Nazis came to Argentina. Let's not even go there. Um, but imagine hearing from those voices. What about from Peru? There's just so many stories that I know nothing about that I would love to learn. So I think it's highlighting the intricacies within our countries and finding out those communities and seeing if we can, again, elevate their voices. And I, I'm sure a lot of the women that are here or men would love to learn more history and more, more of this data. I just feel like it would really enrich and help us make better decisions and better conversations, if that makes sense. <laughs> I was thinking perhaps also you know, I know there is a job bank, a diversity job bank. Maybe it's also a uh, board of directors. Like we have a bank of resumes of people we keep track of. Like who should be on boards of startups, of major corporations? Because I think Facebook has one man. Um, I, I don't remember who's on Google's board right now. I used to remember when I covered tech. But it's... The AI. But there's, there's a, a scarcity of Afro-Latina voices at, at the very top of these companies as well. And if you are there, well, pull somebody up, right? That's uh, sponsorship and mentoring is important. And if you're going to mentor someone who doesn't look like you, learn about them as well. I mean, Julissa, go. I just quickly want to say too, it's so important for us to knock, not knock each other down. Absolutely. Because we're all Latinas and we're all coming from different perspectives and different backgrounds, this is not the time for you to be judging someone or addressing or how do I say this, um, just questioning their identity. This is a time for you to sit down and learn. And this is a time for us to share. Um, I just really wanted to say that, um, Claudia, excuse Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I'd love to kind of second that. Um, and we do that also, you know, we can, you know, tear each other down negatively, but we can also do the opposite of that and build each other up, like you were saying, Claudia. And the thing is, like, in Latinas and Tech, I think there's like 10,000 Latinas. And how many of us are in hiring, at hiring tables? And how many of us are pushing back and challenging and being like, okay, great, this is awesome, but it's a roster of like only 
white or white passing women or where's the diversity in, in, in these, um, you know, where's the diversity here? Because diversity is a term that's being thrown around and sometimes it means women, sometimes it means white women, sometimes it means like, you know, LGBTQIA and all of these are communities that need support, absolutely. But making sure you have true diversity and not just like are checking a box. Um, and if you see it, your company that's doing that, and it's scary and you have to have a certain level of position, but I think some uh, Latinas and tech do have this of pushing back and being like, you know what, no, this is not acceptable. I need, I, we need a true diverse uh, panel of candidates so we can actually make the best decision. Um, because that's what I see in hiring a lot is that um, they hear one person in, right? And they're like, oh, we're diverse. And then that person doesn't get hired. And it's like, well, there was one, <laughs> you know, like you have to have multiple, like we are not a monolith, right? Latinx is not a monolith. Afro-Latinism is not a monolith. Black people aren't a monolith. So why are you just putting one of each and pretending that you get to choose diversity because diversity is everything. Um, and I, you know, I, I say that coming from a, a company that I work for, Alco, and I think um, we're 60, you know, we're like probably 75% people of color <laughs> and like 50% women and like, we have a black, a black Dominican CEO and like, it's, it's just like, this is absolutely doable, but you have to push back and you have to have these uncomfortable conversations within your teams and use your privilege since you're in that room to actually make these changes so that people can continue on um, and create careers and create uh, leadership positions as they come up. Thank you, because that actually, I think answered uh, Edward's question, which was about diversity strategy, who's responsible within a corporate organization for doing this hiring. And you mentioned, you know, if you diversify your hiring team and you seek out places where you don't usually hire from, you know, don't say there isn't diversity in the pipeline, there's diversity in the pipeline if you, if, if you look for it. Um, yeah. And, and one, one point in that is like re recognizing that diversity um, may, is actually additive and not retractive or not, yeah, because I feel like sometimes people are like, well, this person doesn't have this experience and so it's gonna take longer to train them and da da da, da. and it's like, who is telling you that? <laughs> like, have you seen this person's lived experience? Like, have you heard their stories and have you figured out like take, taking that into account as well? And like being like, if they can overcome everything that they overcame, do you really think they're not going to know how to like, you know, get, get some training and actually take, put good use of it and like actually thrive in the company? Like, um, because I think sometimes we're being, we're being compared to a, a standard that doesn't even exist, actually. And the only people that even get close are, are certain types of people. And it's like, who came up with this? Like, why is that the standard of? of excellence and like, how can excellence be redefined in these companies? Well, I think with that, I will begin to close this. Thank you for helping us to redefine what excellence looks like. I think uh, excellence looks like us <laughs> and like Rocio and like everybody else. Uh, and you know, black is beautiful, uh, black life matters. Uh, los, ne lo los negros son bellos, um, los negros importan. You know, all these hashtags we need to promote because there are a lot of voices that are very loud and are and still try to suppress what, the messages that, that we're trying to get across. And thank you for uh, to Latinas in Tech for inviting me to moderate this. I, I haven't been involved as much because I've been away for a year, but I love to um, to be able to jump in at, at this moment in time because it's also, again, a, a subject that I've, I've considered and think about. Uh, and, and, and still, you know, work on, like Catalina said, every single day you work on, um, especially as a Dominicana, dealing with some of the things that, that we have to, uh, you know, the ingrain the racism in, in, in our community. Uh, it, it is a lot to bear, but uh, we continue uh, with the, the good fight. Um, uh, Rocio, did you, want, did you want to close? Uh, Julissa yeah. and Catalina, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Julissa, Catalina, Claudia, uh, this was amazing. This came from your wide open hearts. We are so appreciative of uh, how vulnerable you got yourself to while sharing these stories. This really enriches us because this is what we need to do, learn and have intention. And, and I want to bring in a few things that you mentioned. We, it is our duty as Latina sisterhood 
to amplify their voices, to educate ourselves first, educate our employers, and do not look the other way any time any small comment is thrown out, like mejorar la raza or anything at work. We are, we are in a mission and every single person is accountable as members, as an organization, Latinas in Tech, and as companies. So we'll change this and thank you to the Latinas in Tech Board of Directors for putting their minds into this project that is just starting. Thank you ladies for raising your voices and thank you to the community. This chat was on fire. I saw a lot of resources being shared. Stay tuned, we'll share all those resources. Everybody share their LinkedIn profiles. Thank you. This, we need to grow this Afro-Latina community within our Latinas in Tech and we'll put all our effort to highlight your success. So thank you everybody from the bottom of our heart. Gracias. Bye-bye. <laughs>